Amen. Anybody happy to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Psalms chapter 34, verse 3. I got 29 minutes until my next point, so I'll hurry. Psalms chapter 34, verse 3. Amen. No, I will be mindful of your time tonight. Um, I won't mind it, but I will be mindful of it. I'm just picking. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. What I want to talk to you tonight is this thought, the power of focus. Everybody say the power Power. of focus. Amen. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap of praise and you can be seated. (laughs) To magnify... We understand what a magnifying glass is. There was probably a, a science experiment that you can look back on your life and remember using a magnifying glass. But to magnify means to increase or to make greater. To magnify. To increase or to make greater. Humanity will never make God bigger than what He is. God by Himself is so big and so great, our minds cannot even comprehend. I've tried to comprehend eternity over the last couple of days, and it scares me to death. But I've since lost my fear, and I was telling Brother Steinhauer about this, because there is no time, so we're just going to be in one moment. So we're not even going to realize time is going, so it's okay. Because in my fear, I was realizing time never stopping, and that scared me. But in heaven, there is no such thing as time. So it's one moment that's going to last forever. Amen. And that still is a little scary. But if I do have to spend it somewhere, I want to spend it with Jesus and I want to spend it in heaven. But we will never make God bigger than what he is. Before we were ever created, he filled eternity. And he was unmeasurable. There's not a word that can describe him. There's not a measuring system that man can put together that could come up with an idea of how big that God is. But you and I have the ability to make him as big as we want or as small as we want in our current situation. You can minimize God or you can maximize God. I don't know about you, but I want to maximize God In my life. I want to give God. The head seat at my table. I want God in the whole house. Not in a room on the side of the house. He can have the whole house. He can have the whole farm. He can have the whole bank account. I want God magnified. In every area of my life. Because I've learned something. I can make God bigger than my problems. If I choose to. It's all in what you are willing to focus on. It's all in what you and I are willing to magnify. And can I tell you, I want to be a church that magnifies the name of Jesus Christ. We make his name bigger than anything else in this world. The power of focus. The verb form of the definition of focus means to concentrate. Your attention or effort on a particular subject or task. We all know those people that are super focused. I was never one of those people. But I always wanted to be. But every time I was in the classroom and they were trying to teach me 2 plus 2 equals whatever. My mind would always jump to, man I was wish I was on the playground playing. And the teacher would say, Brandon, focus, focus, focus. And I'm like, I got it, I got it, it's four. When's recess? But we all understand those people that are focused and those people that, amen, or are, are, are have a high intensity of focus. And uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again. We magnify what we choose to focus on. If you choose to focus on God, you will magnify God. If you choose to focus on the devil, you magnify the devil. You and I choose 
what we magnify in our life. That's why it's good that we choose every day Jesus. Jesus said, don't let your conversation be anything other than yes or no. In other words, don't let it be, well, a maybe, I might. Jesus said, anything past a yes or no leads to evil. Why? Because it's a breeding ground for dishonesty. Amen. It's a breeding ground for, amen. He don't know what side of the fence you're going to be on. But every day I wake up, there's got to be no question. I'm living for God today. I'm going to be apostolic today. I'm going to church this Sunday. I'm praying today I'm reading my word it's a yes it's a no it's not a maybe that's what Jesus said anything past a yes or a no is evil remember the one that how, I don't know yes or no choose you this day who you're going to serve choose you this day who you're going to commit your life and submit your life to I want to submit my life to Jesus Christ Amen. There's a lot of things fighting for our attention and our focus. Can I get an amen? amen? We're living in a world that's very distracted. Every person at the red light in front of me is looking down and they don't see it turn green. And right before I'm fixing to put, push my horn, sometimes the Holy Ghost stops me because I have a, the Jesus Church shirt on. <laughs> Tip good if you're wearing a Jesus Church shirt in a restaurant. Amen. I don't want them hating our church. Just kidding. But people choose what they are focused on. You don't have to be around people any time at all. And they will let you know by their actions and by what they're willing to talk about what they are focused on. I take you to the story of Hagar and Ishmael, and I'm not going to take you in Scripture. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it. But the first time that Hagar left Sarah and Abraham, she left because Sarah dealt harshly with her. Sarah did not release her to leave. She left because she got mad. We understand the will of God don't work like that. And so the angel comes to her and says, hey, go back and submit yourself to Sarah, and I will bless your children. I will multiply your seed exceedingly. And then later she has Ishmael. And Ishmael is at the ceremony with Isaac. And Isaac was the chosen seed of God. And Ishmael was mocking Isaac at the ceremony. And Sarah said, the bond woman and her child will not be heir with my son. And she goes to Abraham and she said, put this woman and her son out. And this thing troubled Abraham because that was his son, Ishmael. He loved Ishmael. But God said, you listen to your wife and submit yourself to her voice. And so Abraham goes to Hagar. And he gives her a bottle of water because she's fixing to be out in the wilderness. And he gives her some bread. And she goes with her small child out in a wilderness with just her baby, some water, and some bread. And in Genesis chapter 21, verse 15, it says, And the water was spent in the bottle. In other words, they had used all of the water. And what did she do? She cast the child under the shrubs. And she went and sat down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, Let me not see the death of my child. Several chapters before, she was in the same place. And God came to her and he said, I will multiply your seed exceedingly. I'm going to bless you. Get back and submit yourself to Sarah. And you know what Hagar named that place? She said, the God that sees me. And now she's back in the same wilderness. And she has let a bottle of water that is running empty convince her that her destiny is death. Can I tell you, we choose what we focus on. If we focus on everything that is empty, it will lead to destruction because it has no hope for us. But if we will focus on the God that sees us. If we will focus on the word that God gave to us. The water is all spent. That's what she was focused on. Put yourself in her place. Of course that's what she's focused on. That is what is keeping her alive. The water's all gone. And she starts magnifying the emptiness. 
And when she starts magnifying the emptiness, she starts preparing for death. But can I tell you, death and life is in the power of God. It's not over until God says it's over. And I want somebody to hear me right now. I don't care what the situation is telling you. I don't care what the emptiness is telling you. You still have a promise from God. If you will magnify him, he will be bigger than your emptiness. He will be bigger than your hurt. He will be bigger than your loss. The water running out isn't bigger than the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I'm so thankful for that here today. But if we're not careful, our situations are really good at trying to convince us of what the outcome is. But can I tell you, when you serve Jesus Christ, He controls the outcome, not your situation. And if we're not careful, our situation... Is really good about blinding us to all of the potential miracles and blessings that God is able to do in the midst of a situation when everything else is running empty. The Bible says that God heard the voice of the lad and the angel of God called to Hagar. She's already put him away. She said, I can't see my baby die. And he said, what eleth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. I've come to tell somebody, God has heard you where you are. Arise. I'm so th- God is always about elevating. God, God isn't a God that's going to push you down. That's what the devil does. The devil pushes you down. He kicks you in the, the side. He, he pushes you back. But God tries to bring you above situations. He tries to bring you above your circumstances. And he said, Hagar, arise and lift up the lad. And hold him in thine hand for I will make him a great nation. There's the promise. That, can I tell you, your empty water bottle is not going to affect the will of God in your life. I don't care what is going empty. You think the emptiness is going to affect God from working. God's still going to bless you. He's still going to make a way when there seemeth to be no way. Oh, hallelujah. I'm trying to encourage you tonight. Verse 19. Read this with me. And God opened her eyes. Hang on a second. You're telling me my situation has the ability to blind me? Absolutely. You can be so focused on death that you forget you still got a lot of living to do. You can be so focused on empty that you forget that there's a God that's got things around you that is wanting to refill you. And God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. God didn't create that well. It was already there. But her situation, she was so focused on the empty bottle. Listen to this. She was so focused on the empty bottle. She was willing to throw away her child and separate herself from her child. Because she said, there's no way out of this. There's no way that God can fix this. There's no way that God can refill this. And just up a ways, there was a well of water running. How many times has our discouragement blinded us from the blessing that is within arm's reach? How many times has disappointment, amen, kept us from the blessing that is within? I'm telling you here today, if you will lift up your head, you will see all the blessings around you. You will see all the promises around you. It's not over. Somebody hear me tonight. It's not over just because it's empty. It's not over just because it's broken. God is just giving getting started oh hallelujah Woo. God is just getting started Hagar you remember a few chapters earlier what did you say about God in the same wilderness in the same place you said you are a God that sees me oh I'm so thankful that his eyes saw me one day This is the story that has really been on my heart. The power of focus. I'm telling you, if we can ever focus on God the way that He's called us to, I believe that God is much bigger than all of our situations and all of our problems. He is, there's no question. 
But it takes us magnifying Him in our life. But this is the story that God had in my spirit for the last several days. The story of Balaam. We all know the, the part in the Bible where the donkey, amen, spoke to Balaam. But Balaam was a prophet in the Old Testament. And the king of Moab, Balak, saw the children of Israel coming up out. And he was scared because he was seeing how they were so many and how they were destroying their enemies because they were blessed. Nobody can, could defeat Israel then. Nobody can defeat Israel now. And so the king of Moab calls Balaam a prophet and he says, hey, I want you to curse the children of Israel so I can beat them in war or run them back into their land. And so God begins to deal with Balaam. And Balaam goes to the Lord and God says, you cannot curse these people. Do not curse these people. And God says, don't you even go with them. And then he says, okay, you can go, but if they call you again. Well, Balaam went without him calling again. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against him. And he's riding his donkey. He's riding, and this donkey sees an angel. First off, there's three instances. There's three times that the donkey tries to get Balaam's attention. Number one, he leaves the path. And that makes Balaam mad. He starts beating his donkey. And then... There was a wall, and the donkey rammed Balaam into the wall and hurt his foot. He started beating the donkey again. And then the Bible says that the angel stood in the narrow way where the donkey couldn't move, and the donkey just fell down under Balaam's feet. And Balaam was so mad that he said, if I had a sword, I would kill you right now. Talking about the donkey. Everybody say, poor donkey. It wasn't the donkey's fault. It was Balaam's focus. Because if he would have been more focused on what was in front of him than what was beneath him, he wouldn't have been so angry. A lot of times our frustrations and our anger is coming from what we are focusing on. And a lot of times the things that we are focusing on are the things that we can't change. But can I tell you, God can change them. I said God can change them. But if you're not careful... You will be so focused on the donkey leaving the path. The donkey can, can, can signify the situation. Or the situation not working out. That you allow anger and frustration to literally blind you from the supernatural. You know what unhinged anger and frustration does? It blocks out the supernatural immediately. The negative side of focus. Balaam. Now, I don't know if Balaam got excited because the king of Moab was like, I'll give you anything you want. I'll give you homes. I'll honor you. I don't know if that was the least. Like, oh, man, I, I, could, I could win something here. You know, he's kind of wanting to go. God said maybe not, but oh, I want it, you know. And God is trying to stop him. And the angel said this. He said, if it wasn't for your donkey getting out of the way, he said, I have planned to kill you. Oh, my Lord. Some of the things that are frustrating us may be the very thing that's keeping you alive. But here's the negative side effect of focus. Everybody ready? It can cause tunnel vision. God gave me all this. You're just going to have to believe me. But what I focus on is oftentimes the only thing that I see. Ooh. Oh, God help me right there. Help me right there. You know what? I just believe there's a lot more good than there is bad. But human nature would rather focus on all the negative than all the positive. Can I tell you there may be a lot of bad, but I just believe there's a lot more good. Because God is bigger! If you'll choose what you're focusing on, maybe your situation will turn around. But as long as you got tunnel vision, say, nope, I'm not really not, I'm not willing to quit looking at it. I'm not willing to quit focusing on it. That's all you're going to react off of. That's all that's going to control you. But if you'll put away the tunnel vision, you say, God, maybe I'm just looking at one thing. Why don't you show me some things? You'll be surprised at the revelation that shows up on your doorstep. You'll be surprised at the vision that gets imparted into your spirit is this all right i hope so because i'm just getting started here's the thing about tunnel vision it has the power to even block out god 
we see this. Balaam is a prophet. God meets with Balaam. God talks with Balaam. And he is so focused on that stinking donkey. Eventually, we got to move on from the stubborn donkeys. Come on, donkeys are stubborn. I've been on trail rides before. I used to ride horses. They used to have a mule, which is a mix between a horse and a donkey. And those things are stubborn. A donkey is stubborn. They'll get at the top of that mountain. If they don't want to move, they ain't going to move. God, I want to be a horse. Some of the situations that we are fighting is nothing more than the natural, which, which, which exemplifies a donkey. And I, the donkey ain't ever getting better. The donkey's always been stubborn. It's always going to be stubborn. I want to tell you today, I wish that God would open the mouth of the donkeys and let them start talking. We get so focused on the donkey that we quit hearing the word of God. And God blessed that donkey and let him start talking to Balaam. And that donkey said, have I ever acted this way to you? Have I ever done this? And Balaam said, no, you haven't. And that was when God opened the eyes of Balaam. And he saw the angel standing in front of him. I'm saying, my God, let the church be a church that sees the supernatural. All of these little situations that are in the natural, can I tell you that's beneath us. I don't have time to focus on that donkey mess. I don't have time to focus on the donkeys. I want to be looking forward. I want to see the supernatural. Let me tell you how to recognize a donkey situation. It breeds nothing but anger and frustration and and you can't understand it. Oh, I'm in it. I'm in it right now. But can I tell you, the church better not be focused on the donkey. There's some things that God has put underneath you. I'm preaching to somebody here right now. There's some situations that God is trying to elevate you above. You're going to have to make the decision in your mind. I am focusing on the supernatural. I'm done riding the donkey. I'm done riding the donkey. I, my God, have mercy. The donkey represents the natural. The angel represents the supernatural. We better be more focused on the supernatural than we are the natural. As a church, we better be more interested in the supernatural. This church, we got to be supernatural. We've got to get in the realm of the Holy Ghost where the gifts are in operation and the Holy Ghost is moving. That's where I'm interested in. I'm not interested in the donkeys, the natural. Is this all right? What he was focused on was beneath him, so he had to have his head down. And listen, there's nothing wrong with going through situations that make you want to drop your head. But when a person's head is looking down and dropping, it typically indicates a posture of sadness, discouragement, or defeat. You are not defeated. You are not, you have no reason, I don't, you have no reason to hang your head because of your God. Your situation should not make you want to hang your head because your God has not ever lost a battle. You are If you've been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That is something that you better, Jesus said you better rejoice about it. Don't rejoice that the the devils are subject to you. You rejoice that I've saved you, that I've delivered you, that I've helped you. The Lord, listen, listen, I'm fixing to move on from this point. But Balaam was so focused on the donkey. Now listen, Balaam is going back to the king of Moab with the princesses. The king of Moab sent Balaam some prince, some princes and stuff like that, and they wasn't able to sway him. And so the Bible says the king sent more honorable princes. And so he was with high-profile people. His donkey starts messing up. It reminded me of that time I was taking my wife on a date. I had a really nice vehicle. It was, Brother Joe, you're going to like this. I had a, a red Chevrolet Z71 four-wheel drive four-door with a 10-inch lift with 37s and 22s. I did. But I was also a hospice marketer, and so I bought me a little cash car, a Toyota Camry. Well, everybody was like, Toyotas never break. 
Toyotas, they never break down. They're so reliable. And so I'm about to take my beautiful girlfriend on a date, and I drive to her dad's church trying to act all spiritual. I even bought her some perfume from Bath and Body Works. We go to eat to happy days afterwards. She gets in my Toyota. It won't crank. I said, God, this is either bad luck or you're letting me know I'm out of your will. My Toyota won't crank. That's like the first date. How embarrassing is that? The next day I traded that thing. I traded it for a Chrysler 300. Amen. That car never broke down on me. But Balaam was upset because he's the prophet. He's going to hear from God on this mountain with all these people and his donkey quits working. Can I, can I, can I minister to somebody right now? God has the ability to make your donkey quit working. He has the ability to make that thing start veering off path. Everything was fine in Balaam's life because he was on the right path. Then all of a sudden that donkey starts getting off the path. And Balaam's like, hey, what's going on here? You're supposed to do what I say. And it's like, no, no, no. Everything is going to do what God says. My God have mercy. God's in control. I said God is in control of your donkey. God's in control of the angels. God's in control of the storms. He's in control of it all. So that's why we focus on him. Listen to this. When you focus on the problem, you lose sight of the answer. Hear me. A lot of times we're like, man, man, I got to figure this out. Man, I got to figure this out. There's some things only God can figure out. Hello. Some things, if God doesn't figure it out or fix it, you just got to endure it. It's called the ministry of endurance. But he that endures to the end shall what? So an enduring ain't so bad. But it's like, man, this has got to be fixed. Man, this has got to be fixed. Man, and you focus so much on the problem that you have X'd out the answer. Jesus is the answer. Can I tell you, we should talk more about Jesus than we do the problem. Woohoo! Because that's how we magnify the solution over the problem. When we focus on what we don't have, we lose sight of what we have. Can I get an amen? God, don't let that be us. When we focus on the enemy, we lose sight of God. When we focus on death, we lose sight of life. When we focus on what is going wrong, we lose sight of the God who is in control of everything. Let me give you another quick little story, and I'm almost done. I realize I'm coming up on the 30-minute mark. But I don't need any music tonight. The power of focus. Let me ask you a question. What are you focused on tonight? Can I tell you what you're focused on will control your decisions. It will control your actions. And it will control your joy or your disgruntlement, your discouragement. Can I tell you Jesus will never let you down. And so when everything else has let you down, that is letting you know there's only one way left to turn. God, when I focus on you, all of a sudden I can't see my enemy. All of a sudden I can't see my problem. Can I tell you, when you focus on God, everything else gets out of sight. The king of Syria is warring against Israel. Another, chance, another time here that God, Israel can't be defeated. I'm almost done. And he tells his people in secret, he said, this is going to be the camp. This is going to be the place that I attack. This is going to be the place that I set up. And Elisha, the man of God, the prophet, tells the king of Israel, the king of Syria's game plan on attack. Now, wouldn't that make you mad if you were the enemy? And so the king of Syria brings his trusted men in and he says, who has betrayed me? Who is here? Who is here that is for the king of Israel? He thought his men was betraying him. And I I don't know why I get so excited about this part, but his men says, no king. There's a man of God down there named Elisha 
And he tells the king of Israel everything that you're saying in your bedroom. Can I tell you, God hears what you say in your bedroom. He's, he, 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 he hears what you say on the job. He hears, what you, he hears the thought that you think that nobody else knows anything about. Can I tell you, you can get away from a lot of things, but you can't get away from God. <sighs> you can't hide from God. Woo, hallelujah. That's what I told Brother Vincent. I said, Brother, your brother TJ, he can run, but he can't hide. Come on, that word will find you when you ain't even in the house. That, that's, that's the word that God gave me for his wife that night. I knew God was dealing with her husband. I didn't even know who her husband was. He wasn't even hearing. God's already got him on his mind. Oh, hallelujah. Let me tell you why you're here tonight. Because when you wasn't here, you was on God's mind. And he was orchestrating ways to get you here. To get you to the well. To refill what was empty. Hallelujah. Come on. He's too great not to focus on him. He's too great not to magnify. I say let's focus on Jesus. Let's focus on what he did for us. Let's focus on him. So the king of Syria. I'm almost done. Remember I say this every five minutes until I'm actually done. Sometimes I want to run back and forth really quick to see how quick you can follow me, Sister Jen. The king of Syria said, you tell me, you tell me where that man of God is. I'm going to get him. They said he's in Dothan. And so he sent his army to surround Dothan. He had army and chariots of fire and all this other stuff. And Elisha's servant, little guy gets up. He goes out. He sees that big old army. He runs back to Elisha. And he says, oh my Lord, what are we going to do? Has anybody ever been there? What now? Jesus. I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to focus on him, and he's going to see us through it. That's what. That's what. I don't care what comes. Jesus will be magnified. He said, alas, master, what shall we do? And this is what Elisha said, and I want you to put it on the screen. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16. He said, this is Elisha talking to his servant that has just saw the enemy, and he's scared. He said, do not be afraid or fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Since God is for you, not if, because Brother Story fixed that. Since God is for you, who can be against you? This ain't time for the church to run scared. Who is for us is more than who's with them. God cannot be defeated. And if I stay with God, if I stay on the ship, there will not be any loss of life. <laughs> Elisha said, I ain't worried. Those that are with us are more than those that be with them. And this is what Elisha did. Elisha prayed and said, oh Lord, please open his eyes. Elisha is praying for his servant. He said, open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. God had the enemy. God had the enemy surrounded. The enemy has you surrounded. But God has the enemy surrounded. And God is much bigger than your enemy or your adversary. But if you're not careful, your situation will blind you to that fact. Your situation wants to minimize God, but nothing can minimize God unless you allow it. But I say, God, let your people get the magnifying glass out. Let your people get the focus out and say, God, I'm going to remind myself just how big you are. Let's stand right now all over the house. When you focus on the enemy, your God becomes small. Oh, my Lord. We're running out of this. We're running out of that. This is drying up. Hey, what are you focused on? You're just making it worse. You're just making it worse. Focus on God. Make him bigger than the situation and watch what he does with the situation. This is what I want us to pray. Because I want to tell you something here tonight. Situations can blind us from seeing what God Wants to do in our life. If we're not careful we will make decisions in that blinded state. 
And we will miss vitally, we will vitally miss the will and the plan of God for our life. And so this is what I want us to pray. We're not going to come around the front. You're just going to pray it in your pew. I want us to pray, God, don't let me be blinded by my situation. I felt it so strong in the Holy Ghost. God, just talk to the Lord in your own way. God, do not let me be blinded by my situation. God, I pray right now that you would open the eyes of your people in this place. God, as Elisha prayed for the young man's eyes to be opened that he may see, I'm asking you to open any blinded eyes in this house that has been blinded by situations, that has been blinded by circumstances, that's been blinded by anger and frustration, Lord. I'm asking you right now, Lord, this is your church. These are your people, Lord. Do not let your people be blinded, God. Open the eyes of your people today, Lord, and let them see. Let them see the big picture of what you are wanting to do and trying to do in their life. Hallelujah. Somebody needs to pray that fervently right now. Hear me. There are situations that is trying to blind us. I'm telling you right now, there are situations that's trying to blind us. You don't want to be a blind leader of the blind. They both fall into the ditch. But there's got to be a spiritual seeing. There's got to be a spiritual sight that takes forth tonight. That you've got to see the picture for what it is. Got to show you what the enemy is trying to do. Got to show you what he's wanting to do in your life. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 I thank you for it tonight, Lord. I thank you for it tonight, Lord. Let's give him a good hand clap of praise. We magnify you tonight, Jesus. Hallelujah. The power of focus. I want to be focused on him. Because I don't want to be caught by surprise when he comes back. Hallelujah. Thank you for coming tonight. God bless you. All of our visitors, so good to see you in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. If you're able to come Friday night, Friday night's more than prayer. Friday night, this Friday night is going to be church. Everybody say church. I'm not telling you got to dress up. I'm not telling you you come and pray, but I'm telling you God's going to do something. Brother Cole's going to be preaching. I'm excited about it. And it's another opportunity to refill what is empty. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. God God bless you. You're dismissed.